Let's see what the stew has for us today. <laughs> Welcome to Tales from the Stew Pot. Welcome to the Gnome Cast. Today we have myself, Ange, along with Jared and Matt, and we're going to dive into the spooky season and talk about some gamer horror stories from our long histories in the hobby. Because of that, we're skipping the get to know a gnome question and diving right into things. I believe the three of us combined may have over 60 years experience <laughs> in playing games. I mean, it may even be close to 90 years experience. Yeah, but... I was, was going to say that might. <laughs> yeah, I got my 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, well, un unless you keep going with my thing where the 80s just feels like maybe 20 years ago instead <laughs> of uh... <laughs> Yeah. 90s was last decade, you know. <laughs> We're at the point where we can't say that anymore because 20 years ago was 2001. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That just doesn't yeah. seem right, though. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't seem right. So, yeah, I think the three of us combined have about 90 years experience in role-playing games. Well, it doesn't and... help that the last couple of years just don't count. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or count about a hundred times more than they should. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But given our, our long and storied histories in role-playing games, let's dive into some gamer horror stories from our past. Considering it's the spooky season, let's get started. Jared, how about you? Let's hear one of your scary horror stories. All right. I'm going to call this one Only a Ninja Can Kill a Ninja. <laughs> 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 all right so we were playing in a friend's game all of us were playing ninjas and we had a guest person playing someone else that was in our class that wasn't usually in our group and he didn't get the idea that you know we were all playing you know and this was AD D, so we we're AD D ninjas we were sneaking into like an, an ogre magi's uh castle to assassinate him and our friend saw Ninja and thought he should murder things. So he, as soon as he was alone with one of the other uh, characters in the group, he killed him. And the subsequent rest of the session was our characters hunting down his character <laughs> and killing his character. <laughs> this was not the most mature game that I have ever been a part of, and it degenerated very quickly. <laughs> was not the best introduction for a new player. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that sounds very much like a bunch of teenage boys playing. Oddly, that was a bunch of teenage boys playing. <laughs> How about you, Matt? What's one of your horror, gamer horror stories? So I was going to save this one for later, but I also have a ninja story. <laughs> <laughs> so we were playing Night Spawn, uh, which later became Night Bane because of legal issues. <laughs> uh, which was part of the Polydium system. And the GM was a first-time GM, never did a session before. So you can't really hold this story against her. <laughs> but <laughs> I had decided to just abuse the hell out of the Polydium system and make a ninja-type character with, like, ten attacks around. And, <laughs> uh, of course, this was Night Spawn, so they were, like, the least OP person in the party. <laughs> but I, I guess I didn't make it clear that, you know, just because I was a ninja-like character, I wasn't necessarily a ninja from Japan, although I could have rolled with that. It doesn't matter. But the GM says to one of the players, your mentor says to you, go to Japan. And the other character says, okay, where? Japan is a big place. You know, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do once I get there? This was all of two minutes into the campaign, and the GM had an absolute meltdown because they were unprepared for <laughs> questions for the from the PCs, and they they threw a temper tantrum 
threw all their notes up, up in the air and walked out of the room and would not be consoled. And that was the end of the campaign. <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just picturing like the first question from the uh, player characters just completely. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's pretty much how it went. And you know, oh. we tried to console her and, and say, listen, you know, it's not a big deal. We can salvage this. Let's just go, you know, walk back in. She was having none of it. <laughs> Wow. And again, you know, literally first time ever behind the screen, so nerves, you know, yeah. can't really hold it against her, but it is a horror story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I totally get those nerves because especially, especially back in the 80s, GMing was treated as this, you know, you were on a pedestal. Mm-hmm. Like, I was not allowed to look at the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah. When I first started playing, I was informed that I was not allowed to read this book because I was a player. It's an elite calling. Yeah, it's an elite <laughs> calling. You must have absolute mastery of the system. You must be able to do all of this stuff. And like, it wasn't until, you know, I actually started GMing in the 2000s that I realized how much bullshit that was. <laughs> you must be an absolute master of these rules to know which ones we really didn't mean to put in the book and are completely unworkable with the rest of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so so my first story I'll share is from my very, very early days of gaming. I didn't start gaming until my senior year of high school. And I was a shot. No, I, I don't know that you'd call me shy, but I was definitely awkward and aware enough to know that I was socially awkward. So I was usually kind of hesitant in new social situations. I also, you know, usually am a people pleaser. So I wanted to, you know, do the right thing for whatever, you know, social situation I was part of. And this new friend in school had invited me into his D&D game. And he, obvi- you know, it was very obvious he looked up to this one other kid that was one of the players. Like, you know, you could see him, my friend Tom was the GM, and you- but you could see him deferring to his friend Tom. This is not going to get confusing. Anyway, <laughs> Bad Tom was, oh, he was one of those guys. Like, I was informed as I was making my very first character that I was not allowed to play an elf. (laughs) And when I questioned this, this was because no one can properly play elves. Everyone does it wrong, except for him, Bad Tom. Oh, my. (laughs) It took years and a completely different group before I felt safe playing an elf. Uh. It was bad. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So That's... how were elves meant to be played? This I want to hear. He was I, I I mean, I don't know enough about Tolkien to know, but my understanding is that Bad Tom was a a Tolkien purist, and elves were meant to be regal, mysterious, eternal, you know, and like people would play them as too human, too mortal. And so as a result no one was allowed to play an elf except for Bad Tom, who was an awful player and would play them, you know, is very obnoxious, but... I mean, that's typical elf to this day. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Oddly, you know, not not to get too deep in the woods, but it doesn't sound like he read much of the Silmarillion, considering all the screw-ups that elves went through in there, but, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he... He eventually kind of wandered away and turned out to be a bad friend for <laughs> good Tom anyway. So it's like, okay, it's, I'm, I'm glad my instincts about bad Tom were completely off the mark. <laughs> How about another one from you, Jared? All right. Well, you know, since we're, we're trailing off of each other's stories here, um, I remember a game of Middle Earth role playing the very first time that we ever attempted to uh, play this. And we had one friend who had never 
GM'd anything before. There were basically two of us that kind of passed the GMing back and forth between the two of us. And he was, this this other person in our group was so excited to get this chance to run Middle Earth role-playing. And he was, he was a little more uptight than the rest of our group. <laughs> and we spent the requisite several days building characters because we had no idea what we were doing in this system. And we proceeded to have one encounter that did take us about four hours as we referenced every single chart everywhere in the room. <laughs> and to this day, I really don't know what we were doing, except I think there was a wraith involved. It just, he got so lost in, you know, tracking down rules and finding like... It, it it was not the um it was not quite the Tolkien experience that he was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably a, a good introduction to a uh, role master <laughs> just to uh, get used to seeing that it was very uh table oriented. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's also you know a good example of the you know the 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 desperation of rules mastery that GMs of the time had. Yeah. You know, rather than just being like, okay, let's just make a decision and move on. It was like, no, 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 we must, we must be good players and adhere to the rules, which means we need to look up those rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, that was just a reaction to the previous era of play when GMs just made up everything up off the cuff and, <laughs> and, you know, blue bolts of lightning. If, if I remember, this was in the second edition player's hand, or Dungeon Master's Guide. Blue bolts of lightning would come down and kill your character if you sass the GM too much. <laughs> and so, you know, we went from that end of the spectrum to the, okay, that's it, we're going to button down all these rules so that our GM's not an asshole about things. <laughs> never realizing the rules weren't the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the, you know, rather than just telling the GM, hey, don't be an ass. <laughs> yeah. You know, everyone is here to have fun. Well, you can't talk to him that way. The man's a demigod. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. <sighs> what kills me is that I still, like, I have never, never been a killer GM. I have never been, like, out to get my players. This is not the GM I am, but I still, to this day, have players go, oh, don't piss off the GM, she'll kill your character. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys have been playing with me for 15 years. How do you not know that I am a complete pushover? How do you not know this? I, I was going to say, you've been in enough of my games now, Ange. I apologize whenever I roll too well. <laughs> <laughs> That's like normally I roll. I'm a statistician. I'm not allowed to believe in luck, <laughs> but I have the worst luck when it comes to rolling, which is great as a GM because when you scope 15 rolls in a row, that's good for everybody. <laughs> not so much as a player. As a player, it's a little frustrating. Yeah, yeah. We 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 currently have one of the guys I game with cannot roll above a two on initiative in any virtual tabletop. <laughs> like, it's usually he's fine when we're playing in person and he can roll an actual die on the table, but all of the virtual tabletops have decided he needs to go last in every <laughs> combat encounter. <laughs> Matt, how about another story from you? Uh, well, since we're mentioning killer GMs, <laughs> and it'll take a while to get there, my apologies, uh, we had a player who played with our group, and I, I won't give any names, but they always wanted to pick the the one race, class, whatever, that was completely inappropriate. So, you know, we'd be playing Vampire, the Eternal Struggle, and they'd be there like, I'm going to roll up an Asimite, which, if you're not familiar, they're, they're the nasty assassins that kill other yeah. vampires. So that would have been great in your ninja game. But <laughs> my wife was the GM at the time, and she decides she's never run an evil campaign. And she's just going to go ahead and give everybody license to, you know, be as nasty as they want. And so we have 
like a priest of a death god and an assassin and a something and a whatever. So he rolls up to the game about half an hour late because we didn't invite him and, <laughs> <laughs> and announces he's playing and he'll just make up a character real quick. So we explain the premise. So we didn't have the guts to say, we didn't invite you. You know, please don't feel the need to roll up a character. Just go. So instead, he rolls up a character, and he's a paladin. <laughs> and and it, we, ex we had explained to him the premise of the campaign, oh, and we're all going goodness. to be evil. But no, he's a paladin. He, he uh, swears he's going to do this fallen paladin arc, and it's going to be great, and blah, blah, blah. And so halfway into the session, we find this evil artifact that's talking in our heads, and we all want to possess it, and blah, blah, blah. And he steals it, and he's going to go have it destroyed because, you know, he's a paladin. And we can't have that, and I'm the assassin, so I poison the absolute shit out of his rations. <laughs> and we wake up in the morning, and he eats his breakfast and has to make six saving throws. <laughs> Which, as a paladin, you know, it's still kind of dicey. He could make this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he he finally fails one and takes three die six constitution damage. Oh. And goes into negative constitution. <laughs> and so then he's there like, well, my order is going to res me for free. And they do. And he immediately drops dead again because he still has negative constitution. <laughs> And so he storms out. Years later, he corners me at the comic store and starts telling me what a killer GM my wife is. And I finally <laughs> had to level with him <laughs> and tell him that I'm the one that poisoned his oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Which, for the record, I've killed fellow PCs for being annoying several times. I'm kind of a bad player to be honest <laughs> i mean I, I like i'm stuck on the point that like the guy wasn't invited to the game and showed up anyway <sighs> but nobody felt confident enough to tell him <laughs> you weren't invited on purpose you're no. not in this game and it's it's not like so we lived in the middle of nowhere and so it's not like he just dropped by because he was in the neighborhood. He <laughs> just dropped by after making like a 45-minute drive to get there for no reason. So uh, he knew full well there was a game and that he hadn't been invited, and he was going to show up to spite <laughs> us. And we didn't have the guts to say, we didn't invite you. I think this is this that whole aspect is one of those things that it's probably gotten a little better over the course of gaming and people having a little more confidence in making sure their game group is the group they actually want to play with. But it's still really, really hard to extricate yourself from a player you don't want to play with anymore. Yeah. Well, especially for a long time, all of my games I would run at the local game store. and. You know, that's real hard to uh, say, yeah, um, how about you set this game out? Because it's not like they they can't just show up at the game store. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, 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 you know, over over the last few re years, more recently, have had a couple of situations where it's like, okay, group doesn't want to play with a particular player anymore. How do you move on from that without being mean? to the person because nobody <laughs> wants to be mean and you know in in both cases it was more of group just kind of well in one of them we just stopped telling the guy when <laughs> gaming was you know mm -hmm. he got dropped off of the emails so was no longer reminded that hey there's gaming <laughs> this friday and you know in others it's like group just kind of like picks up and moves and doesn't tell the other player that we're you know we've we've changed campaigns or anything like that it's always awkward it's always painful <laughs> i always wish i could be a little bit more you know a little bit bolder and be like hey look there's been some issues we're gonna move on you know but 
but it's still like so hard to be that mean person to tell somebody they're not welcome in a group anymore. It's funny as that reminded me of Office Space when they uh, quit paying Milton. <laughs> <laughs> so you fired him. No, we fixed the problem. He won't be getting paid anymore. <laughs> and I suppose this is a discussion for another new cast. But, you know, does that player who who is showing up to the game uninvited are they doing it out of ignorance and, oops, it's an honest mistake? Or are they just counting on the fact that it's going to be too awkward to tell them they're not invited? <laughs> <laughs> so my next horror story is my college gaming group I met in the fall of 1989, and we had played pretty much throughout the year. Over the summer, there were some relationship shakeups and a you know, a boyfriend-girlfriend situation ended. So when fall came around, we were a slightly different makeup. And I show up to our normal hangout spot in one of the cafeterias, and the GM is sitting there with this new person that I've never met before. And he's like, hey, Ange, come on over. I want you to meet Christine. She's going to be joining our game group. And I'm like, oh, hey. And she looks at me <laughs> and goes, Oh, I was hoping I was going to be the only girl in the group. Oh, my. I was like, did she really just say that? Was that, that, was that, exact, was that what I thought it was? And yes, yes, that was exactly what I, I thought it was. She nearly ended my friendship with the rest of that group because she literally used, you know, she's one of those... She's one of those stories where a lot of people in the, the 80s and 90s would be like, oh, I don't allow girlfriends to play in our game because she was <laughs> that manipulative. My last straw came a couple of months later and, you know, she had, she was dating the GM at this point because, of course, she was. And all of the GM's attention was being given to her character and his best friend's character. I was the third wheel player at that time, and I was starting to get a little frustrated that uh, that I wasn't able to do anything because all of the attention was on everyone else. And she had she was playing a telepath so she could have these private conversations with the best friend's character, who her character was dating, and it was just all kinds of messy. And I kind of, you know, I have no chill. When I'm frustrated, it's very obvious on my face. And she looked over at me and she's like, oh, I guess we should include Ange. She's starting to look pissy. Wow. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm leaving. And I just picked up my <laughs> stuff and left. And, you know, I honestly don't know how our friendships survived that. Because she ended up cheating on the GM with one of the other players. Not the best friend player, thankfully. But she just like left a wake of broken hearts behind her. And it was like, I found out later that that's just the way she tends to be. She tends, she, at the time, you know, obviously we were all young, late teens, early twenties, you know, that was her way of gratifying herself, you know, just manipulating everyone around her. I am still friends with the GM and the best friend today. <laughs> uh, they are very good friends of mine. I don't know how we survive that, though. <laughs> oh, goodness. And you know she was only specifically making nice-nice with the best friend to hold it over the GM's head to get extra experience and magical items and stuff. <laughs> yep. So that he was jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I was saving one of my stories until I threw some of these other ones out here, but this is one that I call the story game. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I had been running 3.5 for a while at this, well, 3.0 three and 3.5 D&D for a while at this point, and I needed a break. And the person whose house we were playing at, who was somewhat new to our gaming group, volunteered to play because he was very excited because he had a campaign that he had run multiple times and he wanted us all to experience it. 
And basically, he had several old adventures that he had strung together with a meta plot. And in order to play in this, we all had to pick a role because everyone had to play out their part in this story. Oh, jeez. Yep, you can already see where this is going. So w- there were parts like the prince and the uh, royal advisor and the bodyguard. I should have seen some of these red flags right off the bat because I took the bodyguard role and I was like, hey, can I play a swashbuckler as a bodyguard? No, I don't see the bodyguard as being a swashbuckler. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, what would you rather? Well, I, I he really should probably be a paladin. It's like, how about a fighter? All right, yeah, you can be a fighter. So it wasn't even just the role. It was to the point to where he would nix any ideas outside of this, you know, what people were having. So we are start playing this campaign. At some point, we fought an iron golem, and we were supposed to be using 3-5 rules. In the middle of the fight, he decided he didn't like the 3-5 version of the iron golem where you could hit it with any magic weapons. And in the middle of the fight, declared that we now could only harm it with plus three weapons. What? Yes. What? You don't get to do that. <laughs> but yet he did. No, point of clarification, did you actually have any plus three weapons? Why, no, we didn't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but what we did was we um, destroyed the floor underneath the golem and then used uh, the sovereign glue that we had to stick it to that room and the other uh, that we dropped it into, which he really didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> but as this campaign progressed, my my fighter, who was built to, you know, be a fighter, lost all of his armor, which, you know, in 3.5, part of your effectiveness is whether you have your gear or not. So I had no armor, no weapons. I took improvised fighting. But then we were playing in a module where it was from first edition. I think it was one of the Slaver series modules. And they assumed that you would have to scrounge and find stuff. So I was like, well, I took improvised weaponry. So I can pick up a rock and do like 1D, 1D4. That's just a thing I can do. Like, no, not here. Not for this module. What? <laughs> it's like, well, I, I burned my feet on it. Well, that's fine. You can use it outside of this module. But in this module... You're supposed to be scrounging for materials. It's like, I pick up a rock and hit someone with it. <laughs> no, no, you have to go scrounge for materials. I I had a wrestling match with, I think it was, it was some kind of lizard folk. And he decided instead of using the three, five fighting rules, you know, un, unarmed fighting rules, we used that weird chart in first edition that would tell you where you hit someone and whether it did any damage to them, completely disregarding strength bonuses or anything like that. And so, you know, my character got his ass handed to him there. We got to the point to where my character's only real purpose, and I was like, okay, well, I'm the bodyguard. I can't hit anything. I can't attack anything. I have no armor, but I have hit points. So I will stand in front of everything and take damage while everyone else in the party does things. And then at least I will feel like I am contributing. And at this point, we fought vampires. <laughs> and the vampire hit me and knocked a couple levels off of me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Once this happened, after we resolved the fight, we, he was like, well, it'll take you a little while to get the, to the edge of the desert to the first uh, settlement. I was like, well, how long does that take? Like, well, don't worry about it. I was like, no, I need to know how long it takes because if we get there soon enough, I can get a restoration done and I can get my levels back. And he stopped for a second. And he thinks about it. And he goes, you get there like one day too late. What a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You know, th- this is one of those, those gamer horror, s- horror stories that makes me go, Why were you guys putting up with it? mainly i think we all kept kind of doing this because we were using his house at the time and shortly after that i started running at the game store and we didn't mention to him that we were going to be playing at the game store so <laughs> <laughs> again the group quietly picks up in yes. these locations my my favorite part of this though was not even entirely my part of the uh this horror story 
it was my friend who had picked the prince role because halfway through the story, the prince disappears. And so then he had to make a new character who was the prince's half brother. Uh, you know, this, 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 this goes back to a conversation Matt and I were actually having recently, uh, which I think spurred the whole point of this episode where we were talking about how back in the day, story games were considered <laughs> bad because it meant the GM was going to railroad you. Yeah. And this is why people thought that. The the thing that I loved was his subtle, my friend's subtle pushback on this uh, GM tyranny, which was, this was supposed to be the prince's half-brother. The, the prince was human. The character that my friend made was a, a half-elf, half-dragon sorcerer. <laughs> Or a ranger <laughs> and the the dm never picked up on the fact that there's an issue there <laughs> somehow these family lines do not line up here and he also was continually trying like he was intentionally trying to put himself in danger to get killed because he knew that was going to ruin the story whatever <laughs> wherever it was going so he was like <sighs> you see an army of hobgoblins on the ledge below you and my friend would be like well i have no choice i'm just gonna have to swoop down and take on that army <laughs> no no you don't feel like that's the best course of action oh i don't feel like it's the best course of action but i am a hero and it's the type of thing i would do <laughs> so then i would look over at him and go yeah it does seem like the only thing we can do and i'd get ready to charge up too <laughs> and this was this was totally not good because you should be having a conversation with your DM that this is not, you know, a campaign that you are enjoying. But at this point, both of us had just been so, I don't know, so, you know, battered by this story that we were like, nope, I would rather just see if we can completely derail his plan. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, of, of groups will put up with a bad game just to keep the group together. <laughs> My current group, this is this is no offense to the player who first volunteered to run. I appreciate that he volunteered to run. It was an awful campaign. It was just bad. Like I kept my character kept advocating for us to go in the opposite direction <laughs> of the plot because I was so annoyed at things. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, our friendship with that GM survived this and he's a great player, but it was just like and I, I, you know, he has, it's been 15 plus years. He's learned a lot. He's a better GM now, but it was still like, why am I playing this game? Because it's <laughs> gaming and I like these people. <laughs> How about you, man? Another horror story from you? Oh gosh. Let me look down my list and see uh, which one's <laughs> the most appropriate at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go with a brief one, which is, Unrelated, I had a GM one time who had this rule, and I feel like it was a pretty common rule of the day, but I always thought it was the stupidest thing, and that is your character says whatever you say. Oh, God. And that always drove me nuts. Yeah. So, <laughs> that wasn't just my group? No. I, I, I remember GMs, I remember GMs trying to enforce role-playing by saying that what you say is what your character says you know it was kind of like we want more interaction we want more role-playing but there was no because of that same you know story games are bad type of mentality you 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 couldn't do the story and yeah there was there was a lot of that back in the day which since I'm asking if, if my experiences are common experiences, there was something else I wanted to ask about, too. <laughs> I, I always got the impression that this was actually a gamer legend that everyone has heard. Did everybody have some mysterious gaming group, quote, in the neighborhood somewhere who kicked in the wrong door on gaming night because they were a little drunk, screaming about, how they were going, ready to summon demons only to upset the church ladies. <laughs> or was that just my neighborhood? I, I, I have not heard that. that. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I always just assumed it had to be some kind of 
<laughs> urban legend, and it didn't really happen in my neighborhood. There you go. <laughs> I heard a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, like I was in high school when I started playing. So I heard a lot of stories about the awesome college gamers and how they would use the steam tunnels under the college to play <laughs> and all of that. And like, I don't think any of that was actually true. I think there was one college con I went to where I know they had a running nerf battle using paranoia in the steam <laughs> tunnels, but Beyond that, I don't think anyone ever actually played in the steam tunnels. Wasn't that the whole thing that kicked off Mothers Against Dungeons and Dragons? Was <laughs> that one of their sons got lost in the steam tunnels, or at least that was? Yeah, the that's the, the the Dallas Egbert. Yeah, story. I think that was, and I I'm pretty sure that was like apocryphal stuff that ha that got glommed onto the story too, partially by the private investigator that got hired because he was sort of trying to soft sell his act the Dallas Egbert's actual issues and yeah it was <laughs> yeah there was a Tom Hanks movie called Mazes and Monsters in which they yeah. played in the steam tunnels and got lost yeah, yeah that's the, the the clips from that are just <laughs> terrifyingly brilliant talk about gamer horror stories <laughs> You know, there was a point in time when I used to say every great actor has their um, has their one movie that you can point to where you didn't know they were going to be a great actor. And for Tom Hanks, it, it used to be Bachelor Party for me. <laughs> and that was before I saw Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And, and that's, you know, that that's one of those... The whole the whole satanic panic mothers against Dungeons and Dragons thing, it's all you know, it's all stuff gets blown out of proportions. I remember not long after I started playing D and D, you know, I'm still in high school, you know, it's getting towards the end of high school, but I'm still in high school and I tell my mom, Oh, by the way, I'm going over to Tom's to play D and D on Saturday and she's like, Mind you, my mother is not religious. <laughs> my you you could not pay my mother to go to church she hated it she wasn't necessarily anti-religious but she didn't like church she didn't like the social mm -hmm. aspects of all of that she she was probably i'd call her agnostic mm -hmm. you know like she believed in god she didn't believe in church because it annoyed her you never told my mother what to do but she looks at me and she's like isn't that game satanic and I'm just like, oh, God, Mom, no. <laughs> oh. You know, typical teenage girl exasperation with her mom. And it was the only conversation we ever had about it. As recently as, like, the 2000s, I had relatives offer to burn all of my role-playing books to <laughs> purge it, uh, you know, to purge the house of Satan. Oh, wow. my goodness. One of my proudest accomplishments in uh, elementary school was still when I uh, convinced our Sunday school class to uh, play Dungeons and Dragons because we had we had just done this unit where they had the 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 VHS tape of them showing how you know all of these horrible evil rituals happened and you know you probably sacrificed some member of your group and all this stuff like that and I was like this is ridiculous that's not how it works at all <laughs> so I brought my books in and. <laughs> And had our teachers read them, and they're like, "Well, maybe we'll let you do a little bit of a demonstration." So I had like three other people from the group play through like a a scene from um, Isle of Dread, where they fought a giant crocodile. And I was like, "And that's it." <laughs> this is not my story. This is one of my very good friends' story. His family is very strongly Catholic. And he and his brothers had been playing D and D since it, you know, since it came out. You know, like they got the books very early in the eighties when they were young, uh, and they had been playing D and D forever. And one day, one of the church elders goes to his father and is like, "Your children are playing that Satan game. You need to stop. This is why your family is having financial problems." Oh, you know. And his dad was kind of like, "What?" And so he comes home and he starts looking at the books and. You know, my, my, my friend is super excited because his dad is interested in his game. So he basically sat down with his dad. They made a character. I think it was a fighter. 
and they basically ran through a very short adventure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like my buddy is completely unaware that this was because somebody at church had told his dad his sons were into something satanic. So his dad goes back to church and is like, no, you're an idiot. It's not satanic. It's math. <laughs> now, Ange, it is true, though. D&D has led to a lot of people's financial problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just not yeah. quite in the, not in the supernatural sense. Though. <laughs> no, not in the supernatural sense. I think we should probably start wrapping up. Uh, we've we've talked for a while and shared some old school horror stories. <laughs> I will say it's not that everything is perfect now, because I have some modern horror stories as well. But that's just more because people is people, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's always issues that, you know, you never stop working to make things better. It's just a thing right. that happens. And there's a lot of growing pains, you know, like I think people are more likely to try GMing now than they were back in the day because it's not as as it's not as vaunted and mysterious as mm -hmm. it used to be. But you still end up with some people who, you know, are not good GMs <laughs> or you have that really awful player at your table. You know, it's like people is people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, this episode is brought to you by our awesome Patreon backers like the spooky Sam Groton, the creepy Carla Everson, and the frightening Fabrice Bulakia. This show is funded by the Gnome Stew Patreon. You too can become a Patreon backer by following the Patreon link to the Gnome Stew website to the Gnome Stew Patreon. This ad is brought to you by the Phantom Zone. Thought it was only for DC villains? Well, that's where you're wrong. Now the Phantom Zone is open for the placement of those awful gamers that make horror stories happen. Just for a low monthly rate, you two can quietly hide the worst annoyances away. If you're enjoying the Gnomecast, you'll probably, like many of the other Misdirected Mark shows, here's one to check out. They're a Super Geek. They're a Super Geek is an actual play one-shot live stream created by three BIMPOC players to highlight the voices of marginalized folk in the TTRPG scene. They feature gender marginalized GMs and a diverse rotating cast of players. Tune in every other Thursday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time on the Misdirected Mark Twitch. You can find all of us at gnomestew.com, at gnomestew on Twitter, and gnomestew on Facebook. Gnomes, where else can we find you on the internet? Jared, go! You can find my personal blog at whatdoiknowjr.com. You can find me on Twitter at whatdoiknowjr. And on Anchor, you can go to anchor.fm slash whatdoiknowjr audio blog to find the audio recordings of the uh, reviews that I do on my personal blog. Matt, what about you? Are you anywhere else on the internet? No, I'm not. But how about you, Ange? <laughs> <laughs> you can find Matt on Gnome Stew. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as orikes13, O-R-I-K-E-S-13, though Twitter I don't go to that often, and Instagram is a lot of pictures of cats. So, do you think we avoided the stew, or are we doomed to suffer more gamer horror stories. And the stew is coming from inside the house. Oh no! The music for this episode is spooky, mysterious, and suspenseful Halloween music fun in the style of Danny Elfman by Madbeat. Provided by Pond5. Gnomecast is hosted by Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. <laughs> Rob, please edit that out. <laughs> <laughs>